Hey there, I'm excited to share that I have a new free masterclass just for you. It's no secret that e-commerce is booming and so many people are jumping in to take advantage of this now. I keep hearing the same questions from aspiring productpreneurs, mainly how do I know that my product idea is going to be successful? Do I have to get into debt? And where do I even start? If you're eager to start a product business, this masterclass is for you. You can sign up at NicoleDelarzac.com or click the link in my bio on Instagram at Nicole Delarzac and save your spot. See you there. Welcome to the Productpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Delarzac, product development and marketing coach and mom of three. Learn from and get inspired by women entrepreneurs killing it in the product space. Each episode, we will share the latest trends, proven strategies, and inside secrets of the product world, all designed to give you greater confidence to create your own success through a product venture. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 16 of the Productpreneur Podcast. In this episode, I'm so delighted to interview Jackie Quitco, founder of Fressy Bessie Foods, Inc. Her company makes healthy frozen treats that are 100% free of preservatives, additives, salt, sweeteners, or anything artificial, and taste delicious, by the way. Fressy Bessie is a family-run operation led by Jackie and supported by her husband, David, daughter, Alexandra, and a small, hardworking staff. Jackie started her business in 2014 by selling baby foods at local farmer's markets. She later introduced her ice lollies as an experiment, and it became her flagship product. Now her ice lollies are sold at major retailers across Canada. In this episode, we learn so much, including how we need to listen to our customers and go with what they want versus what we want to sell, the process that Jackie went through in order to manufacture and sell her food products, how she expanded from farmer's markets to national retail chains, and how success may not be overnight. It takes hard work, tough skin, and persistence. Enjoy the show. Welcome, Jackie. I'm so excited to have you on the show. It's really dear to my heart because my background is in food. I worked at Kraft Foods and then at Coca-Cola. And so speaking about food entrepreneurship is so exciting for me. And I saw your product in a group that we're both a part of. And I thought, oh, wow, this would be an amazing person to have on the show to talk about food entrepreneurship and how you are creating a healthy product for, for everyone, for kids, moms, uh, and everyone. So thank you for being on the show. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks. So if you could start with telling us about your journey, because I know that you started your career as a journalist and, and you're now in the food business with a very successful food business. So I wonder, how did you get from journalist to food entrepreneurship? Uh, so I was a producer at CBC for many, many years. And at some point, I just decided that I wanted a change, something new to do. And I've always loved to cook. And I have a daughter and I made a concerted effort when she was little, as uh, she's 17 now, to make sure she ate healthy. In fact, I wanted her to be even healthier than I am, which isn't really hard to be. And she's 17 years old and she's, she's pretty healthy eater. I mean, she does like her junk food and stuff like that. So the plan was basically to create a product that maybe I could help parents have the same successes that I was having with my daughter. And so we started, I started with baby food. That was in 2014. And to try and see if it was something that people wanted, I went to farmer's markets. It sold, but it didn't really sell. Like it, it wasn't dramatic. Hmm. So one day I got this crazy idea to take my baby food and put it into dollar store bags, put a stick in it, put it in my freezer, rip the bag off after it was frozen and take those to, they look really ugly, by the way. <laughs> um, I took them to farmer's markets and they sold out. Wow. So we had apple, pear, we had uh, sweet potato, which oh. was popular with some kids. Wow. Um, and, and then we did a carrot and pear, which wasn't very good, but anyway. Um, but the, what, the thing that it showed me was that this was a product that was in demand, a smaller popsicle at a price point. I mean, they were really ugly, so I sold them for a buck. <laughs> um, but um, so that winter, um, I got serious about them. 
and I bought molds and still w went to more for farmers markets and really heard from parents. Price went up, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> really heard from parents how this was a product that they wanted for their children. But then going to farmers markets, you sort of encounter all kinds of people. And so seniors would come up to me and diabetics would come up to me. Uh, back then, it was sort of starting this group of people who were really trying to kick their sugar habit. That's my customer. From there, I really thought I had something. But even then, I was really taking my growth very cautiously. And so I went to two stores in Toronto. I used to joke that I could deliver on the subway line. Back then, there were eight popsicles, and they were in a stand-up bag, and they were like twelve ninety-nine. They were crazy expensive, <laughs> <laughs> and people bought them. Wow! Um, and so we got into about five different stores, and it was only when I uh, was sitting outside one store in North Toronto with eight cases of lollies that I realized I needed to get a distributor. That was my next step. So, but it, it's been a big, really, really incredible learning curve. I'm sure. I would say perpendicular to the ground, actually, yeah. because, you know, I knew nothing about barcodes. I knew nothing about nutrition panels. I knew nothing about labeling. I knew nothing about packaging. I knew nothing about anything. And so I had to learn all of it. It's quite, been quite the journey, I have right. to say. Did you have any help with, with all of that? So um, I did. My... Daughter at the time drew my artwork. In fact, on front of uh, my boxes, you can see her artwork. That's the fruit that you see on it, a little drawn fruit. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. That's really good. And so she did that when she was nine. She considers herself no a little way. bit of an artist. <laughs> and my husband was my, uh, my CFO at the time. Like in the early days, we would go to these events and my daughter would come with me or my husband would come with me. And it was a truly family affair. Oh, wow. That's cool. So actually, I want to take a step back because you started from one idea, which was fruit purees, like baby food. And then it molded into a totally different idea. No, I guess no pun intended, but it, <laughs> it became a different idea. And so I think that's really important for people to hear. You might start with one idea and it may evolve into something else. And that's not a bad thing. It's good to hear feedback from your consumer and then, then iterate from there. And what you did, which was really great, was that when you, you took it slowly, you didn't move too fast. You, you took feedback from people and then you changed as you went along, which is, which is really ideal in terms of growing a business, not like launching full force, but just you want to um, take it step by step. So um, I love that. I think that's a great message for people who are just thinking about an idea or even they have an idea and it's, it's not working the way they want it to just start and keep moving forward. Right. And as long as you see growth, then you should believe that you're on the right path. I recognize, and I guess this was prescient, but who knows, right? That this one product sold more than the other product. And I didn't give up on my baby food for quite some time. In fact, it was only last fall that I stopped selling it. But in the meantime, the popsicles were growing, 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 growing. But it took a while for me to totally give it up. Right. You know, it was my original idea. And you kind of, you know, you kind of invested in it. For sure, for sure. Especially when you have something in your head and you think it's going to work. But it brought you to where you are now. So uh, it right. was a gift. And, and when you think about it that way, why do you feel that your, would you call them popsicles? I, I see that they're called ice lollies. They're ice. Ice lollies. Yeah. Is it the technical term? Because popsicles is a trademark word. I couldn't call them popsicles, but I, and plus I didn't like ice pops. I like ice lollies. So ice lollies is kind of different because they're kind of yeah. different. Most popsicles are made out of fruit or fruit juice or water or sugar or you know a whole but there's a whole bunch of possibilities but none of them are made out of puree fruit period right so, which is what i wanted to ask you about like what is the sort of the difference of your product versus the others and would you say it's a fruit puree fruit it, puree? that it's a hundred percent fruit mm. puree mm. so Every fall, we go into the kitchen and we get a lot of apples <laughs> and we uh, puree, 
we turn them into applesauce and we freeze it in buckets and that's what we spend all summer uh making at mm. our our apple popsicles out of so ontario apples and if you look on the ingredients like even of that box that you have there's three ingredients in that popsicle yes yes i noticed that organic mango organic spinach and organic banana puree and that's it and yes. it's organic, which is yes. another benefit. I never um, thought about that you could take purees and make them into, I guess, ice lollies. We only ever see fruit juice um, versions of it. And when you think about fruit juice, it's like, that's not great because it gives a, a spike to your blood sugar. And so it's almost like having a sugar popsicle. But taking purees is a different different thing it's almost like eating like when i when i tried it it felt like i was having a smoothie on a stick it was interesting it was really cool in terms of the sweetness it's not too sweet it feels healthy it feels like you're eating something substantial someone came up to me at a farmer's market and told me that um he takes my tropical the one you have mm -hmm. uh ice lollies he puts it in a bowl before he takes a shower when he comes out of the shower his popsicle has melted and no then he turns it into a smoothing bowl smoothie bowl oh wow he throws berries and nuts on top of it and the, the thing is that most popsicles um if you melt them down they're watery mm -hmm. but mine aren't right my apple is applesauce so it'll be creamy the oh. tropical is a mixture of spinach banana and mango so it's creamy as well and even the mango like all of them i love that he he makes another product out of it <laughs> yeah. that's so funny there's an idea for you uh, <laughs> and it's also suitable for vegetarians and vegans yep. which is uh very big these days and gluten-free diets so um very cool we're also good for uh, diabetics because it's very low carb because it's just fruit yes it's uh, i noticed that is only 20 calories which is amazing so you just want a little bit of a fruit hit or sweetness hit then you can have one of these and 20 calories is nothing really nice. it's less than an apple <laughs> <laughs> amazing and another thing is that it doesn't have any preservatives sugar water or juice so you've just got basically three ingredients and i guess your other flavors would have how many ingredients like one or two or one so one. apple okay. has one mango has one and then our new one blueberry mango has two Okay, amazing. Now I wanted to ask who is it targeted towards because I noticed that they're pretty small. So is it mostly for children or would it be for like anyone who just wants a small dessert? Like what would you say? I guess the first thing I need to say about my small popsicles is that they're actually a lot more filling than they look. The original idea and really it is the bulk of my target group is parents with little kids. These are healthy parents or parents who may not be healthy, but they want their kids to grow up healthy. And they don't want them eating foods with like, that are overloaded with sugar. You know, the one thing that when I go out to events and markets is that I see little kids coming up to me and they're so excited to get a popsicle. The one thing that, that I it's sort of like the secret handshake with parents is that I hand the child the, one of our popsicles and the parent knows that all they're eating is fruit right and so it's sort of like a win-win situation right you know kid is happy kids dancing around they got their popsicle very happy and the parents are happy because their kids are eating something good someone said i gave my da my daughter two of those green popsicles for breakfast and i thought why not it's spinach banana <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And you probably, as you said, you have a secondary market in people who want low sugar products like diabetics. Right. So seniors like the small size. Mm -hmm. And like I said, then there's like that whole battalion of group of people who, you know, I like to joke, they're the one cookie people or the half a cookie people. <laughs> right. You know them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, small popsicle. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the size actually. As you said, they're they're a bit filling. Like you feel like you're having something more substantial than just something watery. So I can imagine definitely for parents with small children as they're growing older, they don't want them to start with the sugary things. So this is a perfect, uh, perfect way to give them their dessert and a treat. 
I would like to get into how you launched your product and the steps you took. So I wonder if you could walk us through what did you do to get to where you are? So for example, when you launched it, did you do any research at all or you just kind of took it to market and see if it sold? It was a bit of that. Um, it was a bit of, let's see, I saw what was on the market. I, I wasn't really impressed what was on the market. Mm-hmm. And so I thought maybe, you know, how I fed my daughter might resonate with parents. And then I just waited to see if it would sell. When it didn't really take off, I went to plan B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that did sell. And so from there, I did two things. I had to find a commercial kitchen uh, where I could produce enough of them. That's where we are right now. I needed a distributor to take my product in a freezer truck as opposed to my car in coolers and pre-built cases to stores. And so I went to my distributor with, I don't know, about 13 stores. And now we're in um, 160 stores. Amazing. Wow. So 160 stores including the chains that you're in as well, or are these individual stores? So we're, we're mostly in the greater Toronto area. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this past fall, I decided to open, I have a national distributor. So I decided to open the West. So I did two things before the pandemic hit. I planned this year to be a big growth year. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we opened the West. I went to CHFA in Vancouver and introduced my product to store grocery stores in the West. And then I hired some brokers, one in Quebec and one in the rest of Canada to help spread my product into more stores. Little did I know that a pandemic was going to hit. And so on one hand, the decision to be in grocery stores has proven very good for me because that's where people are, is in grocery stores. But getting into new stores has been a little bit of a challenge in this sort of environment. Uh, But we've been, we've never been busier. You know, we're six years old and people are really starting to learn about us. I think they like what they see and, you know, hopefully they're willing to give us a try. That's great. Now you, you mentioned that you're in a commercial kitchen. Like, how did you find them? How did you pick the right kitchen? Like, and you, and I know you produce it yourself. Is that correct? Yes. So we make our, our popsicles. You know, it was just a matter of Googling commercial kitchens. And this one appealed to me because at the time when I started making my popsicles there, uh, they had a what you call a blast chiller, which means I can make, well, right now we, we do over a thousand popsicles a day. But back then, you know, we could do, you know, as many as we needed a day and that they would freeze in the blast chiller in an hour instead of like six hours in a normal freezer. They also had a ginormous freezer, like the big as big as two classroom sizes to store my, st- my popsicles, which is proving great right now because we have pallets of cases of popsicles going out to the distributor on a regular basis. Right. The distributor that you used again, you did you Google them or how did you come up with choosing that route? <laughs> well, I it was so funny. Um, I got turned down by a lot of distributors. Oh, okay, so what, okay. So one fall, there's um, the Canadian Health Food Association meeting in September that happens here in Toronto. And I took one of my employees with me and I put her behind my table and I said, I'm not leaving here without a distributor. Because <laughs> all the distributors were there. And so I, um, I found one to take me on and they were a national distributor. That's great. So you had some rejection. Oh, yeah. Well, I never focus on rejection. No, but that's good for people to know. Like, yeah, you had to. <laughs> oh, my God, you're going to get rejection. turned down so many times. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not like a, a slam dunk every time. You have to almost like be a, a champion for your product. You have to dust yourself off and keep going. That's right. Yeah, no, that's amazing. How many distributors did you need to talk to before you found the right one? Four or five. Oh, okay. All right. So it wasn't horrible, lot. but as I like to joke, they didn't believe in the lolly. Ah, okay. <laughs> you have to believe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you showed them. <laughs> exactly. So you are now in different stores. You said 160 and I believe, well, I got this one at Longo's, but I've, I've seen your 
that you're also at Metro and Whole Foods. And so you've gotten to some big chains. What was that like? Did you, did you need to go sell it to them or did your distributor do that for you? Whole Foods, only the Whole Foods stores in British Columbia and that my broker Mm -hmm. managed to get for me, which I was really pleased about because Whole Foods is a really great retailer. And Metro was my first big get. It was the kitchen that I was in. There were some people with very big connections in the food business. They got me into four stores in Metro. And from there, we're in about, we're just shy of 60 stores. 60 stores in the Toronto, the GTA. We're in just about every metro store in the greater Toronto area. And we just made it into the first store in Ottawa, uh, which I'm really pleased about. Ottawa has been a tough market to get into. Oh, really? Why is that? Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea Government why. It's- interesting. I think I think the West will be great because they're not to stereotype, but they're very healthy. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, we've really taken on the West. Like we're in BC and we're in, uh, we're not in Alberta yet or Manitoba, uh, but we're in Saskatchewan and they're doing really well there. Like I was really pleased to see that they live up to their reputation. Right. You know, yeah. We always know as people in BC are very healthy and health conscious and everything, and they're finding my popsicles. So I'm pretty pleased about that. Nice, nice. Now, do you produce here and ship the, to BC, or do you produce over yes. there? Yes. Oh, okay. So my distributor has two warehouses: one in Ontario, and one in uh, in BC. Okay. And so they take orders from across the country and they ferry them around. Okay, cool. Now, food has many different regulations, safety guidelines, and things like that. How did you educate yourself on this and ensure your product would be safe and compliant? Um, So I have taken a lot of food safety courses. So we're not HACCP certified, but it's only because I haven't gone through the the motions yet to be HACCP certified. We fill out all the paperwork. We have all, all the things in place. Plus the kitchen that I'm at, has what they call a GMP in place. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that nobody goes into the kitchen without a hairnet, a lab coat, washes their hands. And so it's a, it's, it's a good place to be. I've been in other kitchens. I used to produce in other kitchens that weren't so stringent, but this kitchen I'm in right now is, is pretty tight. Okay, that's great. Yeah, GMP, good manufacturing process, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And HACCP is another certification. Sometimes um retailers want you to have that certification. So you didn't come across that with any of the retailers. So uh Sobeys requires it. And so I'm just you know, I'm waiting for the pandemic to end. Yeah, exactly. So you you did some self-education work. You took courses and had to learn some things about this because that is unique with food. You need to know like about safety and labeling and, and all the requirements there. Yeah, and I also uh, purchased a food trace uh, software so that if there's ever a problem with my uh, product, I can yank it off out of the freezers. So So we're almost there. We're just, like I said, just the pandemic has sort of affected certain things. Right, exactly. Now that you've gone through like all the processes, um, when you were developing your brand and your packaging and website and everything like that, what were some of the things you learned? What kind of process did you go through with that? I lucked out and found someone to design my packaging who came from the food business And so she designed, this woman designed my original packaging. And so we've just tweaked it along the way, but it has all the important things on it that need to be there. Yeah. And in terms of developing your brand, actually, how did your brand name come about? Fressy Bessie. (laughs) The original company was Baby Food, right? And I had found that most Baby Food had very earnest names, and I didn't want an earnest name. That's not who I am. So I wanted a fun name. And the, um, the Yiddish word for eating is to fress. So I went with Fressy Bessie, uh, oh. only because that rhymed. Okay. I did have a great aunt named Bessie, and she was quite the businesswoman, actually. So <laughs> I have a feeling this, the spirit of my Aunt Bessie is sort of operating oh, around okay. me. <laughs> I love it. It's a very cute name. I was just wondering how that came about, but that's it's very cute. It's kind of like fresh and um, exactly sounds, sounds very personal too. 
then in terms of getting trial and awareness of your product, that is always a challenge. How do you manage to do that? Have you done a lot of uh, sampling or um, coupons? How do you get your awareness out there? I go to lots of events and I take, I have a sample size of my popsicles. They're very cute. They're about this big. And, um, and when I go to events, it's hard to mail them out because they'll melt and we'll end up with soup. It's funny. I get contacted all the time of sampling companies and I'd love to do it. I just can't. To ship my popsicles is prohibitively expensive dry ice and coolers and everything and then overnight shipping and even during the pandemic they can't guarantee if it's going to arrive the next day Mm -hmm. and so it could arrive three days later and then you've got soup so it's hard to do Uh, when i go to chfa well we don't know if it's going to happen in september but when i have gone in the past i go with samples and so a lot of nutritionists go to chfa and obviously a lot of Retailers go. Just for people who don't know, can you tell them what that stands for, CHFA? Oh, Canadian Health Food Association has two meetings a year. Okay. And it's a meeting specifically for people in the health food industry. So not just stores like the Big Carrot or Nature's Emporium, or, but also like nutritionists show up or all kinds of people in the health food industry all different sides show up at this meeting. So it's a great place to sample your products because you get a real cross-section of of the whole health food industry. Right. And those are the people who would recommend your products to others. Yes, exactly. Yeah, great. And and yeah, also, I mean, it's uh, it can be a challenge in the frozen section to get people to notice your product on shelf. Is there anything you do on shelf to to help drive that initial purchase normally i go and i or i hire people to go into stores and do sampling but not not now now. (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) but normally (laughs) right right yeah because i think that's key is is get getting trial of your product and just people to be aware how amazing they are for you and the health benefits so um and i can imagine it is a challenge with a frozen product to get that sampling and trial i know yeah how long is the shelf life Oh, about a year, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, that's great. And even after a year, they're still, they won't poison you. Uh, but what, what they will do is just get a little bit of freezer burn on them. Oh, okay. Got it. But they won't taste as good. Okay. When you compare that to items that are fresh and so well, that's that's an even bigger challenge people have to worry about the shelf life but for you that's that's not an issue so that's great. So now what let's just talk about your business in general and your mindset that you needed to, to go through to get to where you are. What do you wish someone would have told you before you started your business and what has really surprised you? Well, on the one hand, did I know how hard it was going to be to build a, a brand? The other thing is you kind of, you kind of think, wow, they're just going to discover this. And then someone's going to tell somebody and someone's <laughs> going to tell somebody. And then all of a sudden you're going to be a household name. Right. Wrong. Yeah. No, I know. <laughs> I try to tell anybody starting out and I find like I'm not young, uh, but I tell, I see all the young people starting out and I keep saying you need to be in, if you believe in this and you see growth, you need to be in it for the long haul. This isn't going to happen overnight and that you're never going to work harder than you will building your brand. It's, it's not, as I like to joke, for the faint of heart. This is, this, is, uh, this is hard work. It has to be because the payoff eventually can be really great. Right. If it wasn't hard, everyone would be doing it, but right. everyone's not doing it. And it takes time. So you said you've been in it six years. So it's not an overnight thing. You've, you've got to put in the time and, and have some patience. What hurdles did you overcome personally as you were growing the business? Well, just just like knew nothing about it. You know, I had to learn every step of the way, still learning, but it's been fun. Like I, you know, I, I consider it a great challenge and I'm actually enjoying this more than I thought, thought I was going to enjoy it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I get a big purchase order from my, you, you know, distributor, it's like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. One thing you said is, is not for the faint of heart. That's something that somebody I, um, 
used to be in business with always told me business is not for cowards. It's true. Right. Yeah. You've got to have some courage. (laughs) Well, and you have to like stand up, stand up to the naysayers too. Cause you know, my mother, (laughs) do you want to leave the CBC? (laughs) (laughs) Did you leave the CBC to start this or you sort of like, was it on mat leave or like when did how did that happen it was it was soon after i came back from mat leave and it just wasn't it just wasn't what i wanted to do and i wanted to be home for my daughter and i wanted to be able to you know when with when you work in news you work all hours of the clock uh you work weekends you work this time you work that so anyway this seemed like a better fit for me. So did you start this at the same time as you were working at the CBC or did you just do a clean cut and start working on your project? No, I was, I was still working there and, uh, and started growing, like started the business, but just me, I wasn't very busy. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I had amazing. lots of time. <laughs> oh, okay, good. And what is the one thing you'd like to have help with at this moment? A co-packer. We are at the point where I really want to, really want to scale up and I can't do it where I am. And so I am looking around for someone to make my product up to my standards, of course, Mm -hmm. Um, but to make it so that we can look at, you know, Loblaws, we can look at, you know, some of the the bigger chains because right now I, there's no way I can supply them uh, with the amount that I make. So to really grow the business. And then of course, you know, we'd love to get in uh, to look to the US, but we can't do any of that until we get a co-packer. And what are your five-year goals? So we hope to have good penetration within the next year um, mm-hmm. of Canada. Okay. And we want to we want to grow substantially in this country. And once we do that, then we will start looking south for the United States. Oh, that's great. I'm sure they would love the product too. Uh, Any top tips you want to tell people if they're thinking about getting started in the food business? Do your homework. Test your product out if you can, just to make sure, you know, just to make sure that this is something that people want. Listen to the feedback, listen to what people say, and then be patient because it's going to take time. Yes, I believe in getting feedback from consumers as well. Just concept testing, focus groups, trials, whatever you want to call it, you need to get that feedback before you scale. So that's really good. And and yes, taking time because it can take time and don't worry that it is taking time. Okay. Awesome. Can you tell people where we can find your products? So if you go to the Fressy Bessie website, um, there is a tab that's the store locator. And then all you have to do is put your postal code in and up will come the stores that are as close close to where you shop. Yeah, so that's basically how to, how to find my product. Awesome. So fressybessie.com. Yeah. Okay, great. And if you're a store and you want to stock them, um, there's a wholesale page and we're carried by UNFI and the codes are there on the wholesale page. Awesome. And I also saw that you have your social handles is um can you tell us what those are oh so um yes instagram please follow me <laughs> at fressy messy twitter at fressy messy <laughs> and facebook facebook.com slash fressy messy yes. <laughs> awesome okay so i will put Type that fressy messy the- they all come up <laughs> Okay, great. I will put that in the show notes. Everyone can find it and try them because they're amazing. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing your story and for uh, sharing all your wisdom with us. It's just been so lovely to have you on the podcast. And I can't wait to try more flavors because I've tried the tropical one. And uh, I even want to try your other flavors because I'm sure they're amazing as well. And I can't wait to see you grow (laughs) across the nation and in the US as well. So good luck with everything and thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Productpreneur Podcast. If you loved this episode, we'd be so grateful if you could take a sec to subscribe, share it, and review it on Apple Podcasts. Your review will help more women build their own dream product business. 
By the way, if you have any feedback, comments, or questions, email me at info at Until next time, keep dreaming up those product ideas.